Hello and welcome to our Naturescaping Basics virtual workshop. I'm Charlotte and I'm here presenting with Andrew and we both work for the Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District. In this presentation, we're going to cover the primary principles of naturescaping, which is a method of landscaping that focuses on mimicking natural landscapes. But before we dive into the main material, we're going to quickly introduce you to who we are, what we do, and why we care to teach people about naturescaping. As I mentioned, we work for the Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District. The primary function of a conservation district is to work with residents of their county to protect natural resources like soil and water and habitat. And a conservation district is a local unit of government, so usually it receives funding either through a local tax base or through federal funding and grants. We work with our community in a couple different ways. Uh, we could provide technical assistance, which includes advice, planning support, resources. We also provide financial assistance through grants and cost share programs. And we provide education programs like this webinar um, and education materials. So we work in Washington County, Oregon. Um, you can see on the map of Oregon there, it's up in the northwest corner of the state. And our county is, um, by land use, it's about 15% an urban population, 35% rural and agricultural lands, and 50% forest land. So there's a lot of different land types um, in the county, which means that there's a lot of different conservation issues present um, and a lot of different conservation practices that we can use to improve watershed health. If you don't live in Washington County, we do encourage you to look up your local conservation district. Almost every county in the US has one, so you should be able to look them up online and see what kind of resources they can provide. We like to provide folks with a bit of background about why conservation districts even exist. A lot of people haven't ever heard of them before. And interestingly, they were a product of the Dust Bowl. So in the 1930s, the US experienced a natural resource disaster known as the Dust Bowl. And farmers in middle America had spent years heavily cultivating their lands without using practices that would ensure the long-term health of the soil. So the structure of the soil had been greatly disturbed by plowing and they'd removed a lot of the deep rooted plants that once held the soil in place and made sure that moisture stayed in the soil. So after several years of drought, that unhealthy soil turned to dust and was blown into the sky and created black blizzards um, that affected over 100 million acres of land in the central United States. And then the dust storms from that area impacted the entire country's health and economy. So in response to this disaster, the federal government established the Soil Conservation Service, which is now known as the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, and the goal of that federal agency was to help landowners preserve the health of the country's soil and other natural resources and make sure that something like the Dust Bowl didn't happen again. Um, and at that time, President Franklin Roosevelt famously proclaimed that the nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. So there was an increased focus on protecting natural resources on a national level. And in 1937, the federal government recognized that locally driven solutions would actually be the most effective way to address natural resource concerns. So they encouraged individual states to establish local entities that could promote soil health. Um, those local groups would be more familiar with the local soils, local water systems, the climate, and would be better able to help land managers um, managing their, their natural resources. So that's where the conservation districts came from. And so, like I mentioned, they now exist in almost every county of the U.S. And our work has expanded greatly beyond um, agricultural lands to include conservation issues in urban areas, forest lands, and a focus on community health and food systems. Another bit of context that we like to provide before diving in is an explanation of what a watershed is. Um, so throughout the presentation, you'll hear us mention benefits to the watershed. So we wanna make sure that everyone has an idea of what that means. A watershed is a drainage basin. So it's an area of land where all the water that falls onto it or runs under it is draining to the same location. And the boundaries of a watershed are defined by the shape of the land. Um, so by the mountain peaks and the slopes and the valleys. And you can think of it as a bathtub. Um, so the sloped edges 
of that tub are directing all of the water to drain to one spot. And we find it helpful to talk about conservation at the watershed scale because a watershed is an area where all the water is connected. So that means that most of your issues with natural resources, um, so soil and habitat and water quality are also connected. And if you are somebody who lives in Washington County, you are part of the Tualatin River watershed. So all of the water that's falling around you or flowing around you is draining into the Tualatin River. And that's actually where our district gets, gets its name. So what's important to remember is that everyone lives in a watershed, and so everyone has a significant impact on the health of that watershed. You might be wondering how naturescaping fits into this all, um, because watersheds are, can be really vast areas of land, but the reality is there's a lot of simple steps that people can take to benefit the watershed as a whole. So it's the idea of big things happening by a series of small things put together. And so as we walk through the principles of naturescaping, you'll hear about the different ways that this practice can benefit the watershed, including reducing rainwater runoff, reducing pollutants that reach our waterways, providing habitat for wildlife, and much more. So if you are improving the natural conditions on your property or in your community space, you're also improving the natural conditions of the watershed. As Charlotte mentioned, today we'll be investigating the basic principles of naturescaping. For more advanced resources, I'd like to point you towards our website, which is tualatinswcd.org, or in the, the additional resources list located in the description of this video. Naturescaping is a landscape design practice that mimics nature and benefits watersheds. In essence, naturescaping is planting the right native plant in the right place. Naturescaping uses simple techniques to welcome people and wildlife to a landscape. I always like to think of naturescaping as extending nature into our backyards or into our yards in general and community spaces. This helps create connected wildlife habitat throughout our landscape, which greatly benefits our neighboring wildlife in which we share the land. Before starting a naturescaping project, it's best to write out your goals. Some of the things that you might want to consider as you're planning your goals for your, pro for your naturescaping project are, what are you trying to accomplish with your naturescaping project? Are you hoping to have a, a landscape that's buzzing with life? Or are you trying to create a backyard oasis for yourself and for your neighbor, neighboring wildlife? What do you want to see within your, your landscape? Is there a view that you want to keep or is there a view that you want to block? What type of animals are you hoping to, to share your landscape with? As I mentioned earlier, naturescaping is all about mimicking natural areas around us. So is there a local park or natural area that you really find solace in and that you'd like to mimic? Uh, these, if there's a place that you very much connect with, Observe the plants that you find within that area and try to re recreate that landscape within your own, at your own location. Today we'll be covering these nine principles in greater detail. It's important to remember that naturescaping is not an all or nothing concept. You can emphasize some of these principles over others, but what's most important is that you pick a design that fits you. Your design will depend on a wide variety of things. How much gardening do you like to do? Do you prefer well manicured landscapes or are you okay with more uh, wilderness areas? It's important to remember that native plants can be incorporated into any landscape. So make sure that you're building a landscape that fits you. Before we look at those principles in greater detail, Let's examine a few before and after photos to get our creative juices flowing. This first photo is older, but you can see that this, this yard here lacks a focal point. It's just an expansive grassy area. This landscape is, uh, is barren for wildlife. Wildlife has little use for grass because they don't provide, because it doesn't provide habitat. Now examining this photo closely, 
If you look beyond the fence, you can see that this landscape, this yard, is surrounded by a natural area. What That natural area holds a ton of wildlife habitat. But as that wildlife approaches that fence, it becomes a, a wild, it essentially becomes a desert. Now, by contrast, this is what a naturescaping project can do for that landscape. This project has blended that natural area and this yard. Not only does this benefit wildlife by creating additional habitat, but it makes this landscape look much bigger. Now, we meant, I mentioned earlier that uh, naturescaping is not an all or nothing concept. If you look at this, this completed photo, you can see that this project did not remove all of the lawn, but they were just intentional with what they kept. This is what we're referring to when we mentioned that you want to design a project that fits you. Our next example shows a naturescaping project that shows that naturescaping projects don't occur overnight. In this project, this is a, a, a first year of the project that's getting underway. Prior to the project, you can tell that this yard lacked privacy and that the focal point was on that white fence that you see on the right hand side. In year one of this naturescaping project, they focused on building the foundation and then allowed the plants to build up and complete their project. A couple of main things that you want to consider as you're um, in your early portions of a naturescaping project is to install your foundation areas. In this project, they installed gravel, which is known as pervious surfaces in high use, in high use areas like this walkway and that sitting area. This is a concept that we'll talk a little bit about in just a bit. They also created deep beds for their plants and they allowed those plants room to grow. Plants need space to get started. I always like to start with planting the larger plants or plants that I know are gonna get big. And then as they grow in, I'll fill in the gaps with smaller plants to help complete the landscape. A few years later, you can really see the difference. Plants have filled in to provide this landscape with a lot more privacy. You can't see out into the yard anymore. You can't see the, the neighboring houses. Also, you'll notice that this landscape incorporates a, a wide variety of plants. These different types of plants provide different habitat for wildlife, and it really provides a, an all-encompassing landscape that supports a, a wide variety of wildlife. This landscape is simple, it's easy to maintain, it's relaxing, it's a place that you want to spend time. So as we dive into the nine principles of naturescaping, keep in mind this isn't an all or nothing concept. All of these principles result in some degree of environmental benefit. So you can be thinking about what works for you in your space. And that is especially relevant for this first principle, which is finding alternatives to lawn and grass. So this means looking for opportunities to replace your lawn spaces with plant mixtures that will provide more benefit to the environment and will potentially provide you with something more interesting to look at. Across the U.S., we have converted about 40 million acres to lawns in this country. So that's about two-thirds the size of Oregon that's planted just in turf grasses. And lawns can be great for certain things, providing kids or pets with places to play or allowing space for sports. But there's also some major downsides to covering our properties in lawns. Um, the lawns create a monoculture, which means that there's just one species there. And that doesn't provide much benefit for hab or habitat for wildlife. And they also require a lot of upkeep. So a lot of fertilizer, pesticides, mowing, watering. They're definitely not a low maintenance landscape. So they, they are high input and low ecological return. So finding alternatives to lawn allows for greater environmental benefit. And this doesn't mean that you need to get rid of every inch of your lawn in order to have a naturescaped yard. It's more about thinking where your lawn makes sense, where you use it, and where it doesn't make sense. So maybe you wanna keep a backyard lawn available for children to play in, but what about converting the parking strip out front if that's a space that you're not using? Or maybe you like having a grassy spot in the yard for picnicking or lounging. And can you think about just reducing that lawn space down to the, the area that you would actually use? 
So you're probably wondering what you can put in place of lawn. We're gonna look at a couple examples. The first example is a practice called meadowscaping. And it involves planting a mixture of native bunch grasses and wildflowers to mimic a natural meadow habitat. It provides incredible habitat for pollinators. Um, and as you can see, this is a much different aesthetic from a lawn. So for some people, this may be too wild looking. It might not be, they might not be ready to make the jump from a manicured lawn to a meadow, but it does provide an awful lot to look at. Another option is to create a pollinator garden. So this is a, a before and after photo pairing. In the left photo, you can see just a degraded patch of lawn that isn't really serving any purpose. Um, it doesn't have much biological value because there, isn't, there aren't many species there, it's not very healthy, and it also doesn't provide aesthetic value. It's not very nice to look at. So this homeowner decided to convert this space to a pollinator garden. And you can see the beginning of this garden in the photo on the right. They have just planted a variety of native plants that will provide good habitat for pollinators. And native plants are really well adapted to the local climate. So once they get established, they aren't gonna require much maintenance in terms of water or fertilizer. So they're actually lower maintenance than the lawn. And from looking at the lawn space, this is somebody who probably didn't have the time or desire to, to put a bunch of resources into their lawn. And you'll also notice that they thought about how they're using this area when they planned their garden. So the primary use of the lawn space was as a shortcut from the front step out to the sidewalk. So they were able to still preserve that use by including a pathway in the design of their pollinator garden. So it's definitely important to think about your use patterns and how you want to continue using space when designing your project. We've got two more lawn alternative examples to share here. On the left, you can see the use of ground cover plant species in place of what was a grassy parking strip. And a ground cover is gonna provide the same lush green, low-lying look as grass. But as you can see by the different colors of green in this picture, there's a lot more species diversity there, um, which is really great for wildlife. And if you use native ground covers, um, this is gonna be a low maintenance option because once they're established, they really don't require a lot of care. On the right, you can see an example of replacing a lawn with garden beds for food production. And this certainly doesn't count as a low, low maintenance alternative, but if you are somebody who has uh, the time to spend tending the garden beds, it's a great option because it has the benefit of providing food for you while also providing more plant diversity than a single species uh, lawn would provide. So the key to this principle is taking a look at where you have lawn space, deciding whether you're really using that lawn for anything, and then thinking through some alternatives that include more species and lower maintenance. The second principle of naturescaping is to layer your vegetation. So this creates multiple overlapping planes of plant groups. As with many of these principles, the key is to mimic nature. So if you think about walking through a forest or another natural area, you'll notice that the vegetation isn't all just in one layer. There are plants low to the ground that are then covered by taller plants that are overtopped by shrubs and then small trees all the way up to your large canopy trees. So this is something you should aim for when you're creating your space. And from a design perspective, you can think about this in the same way you might plan out a room in your house. Start with a large object, like a couch, and then fill in around that object. So place the rug underneath, place the lamp on the side. So in your yard, you would start with your tree layer and then fill in around that. So think of your planting plan as a 3D picture. You're creating vertical layers while also filling in all of your horizontal space. And from an ecosystem perspective, think about how wildlife are using different parts of the plants. So all these different species need different types of habitat. They need a diversity of shelter. Some species rely on tucking away into trees and shrubs while others might need to be hiding under thick vegetation near the ground. And a lot of species are traveling between different vegetation layers to find food and water and shelter. So layering the vegetation creates more habitat and it breaks your space up into smaller rooms for wildlife. 
And so remember as you're creating your planting plan that each vegetation group provides a different fun function both to you and to wildlife. So trees can provide privacy and cover. Shrubs also provide privacy and are really great for providing different seasonal interests. Um, ground cover can reduce uh, weeds popping up and also provide some really interesting aesthetics. And so towards the end of this presentation, we'll look at a couple examples of Pacific Northwest native plants that fall into each of these categories so that you can start thinking about what might go into each layer of your planting. We like to share this infographic that shows how layering veg vegetation creates diverse habitat for wildlife. So this graphic focuses on bird species and you can see that different species are using different layers of the habitat. So certain birds like sparrows are going to be drawn in by ground cover, but then your bluebirds and wrens and chickadees prefer to have some options in the understory and the midstory. And then if you move further up, you might attract woodpeckers or nut hatches if you have a healthy canopy. And then larger birds like hawks are going to use the space above the canopy. So you can anticipate what kind of wildlife you might attract um, by looking at the different layers that you're planning in your naturescaping plan. We want to point you to a great resource from the Audubon Society. If you are wondering how to get started putting together a plant list, this is a great place to go. Um, all you have to do is enter your zip code and then it will provide you with a list of recommended plants as well as the types of birds that those plants would attract. And you can even filter by certain birds. If there's something that you really want to bring to your yard, it'll give you recommendations about what plants are needed. So that's, you can find that by Googling Audubon Society's Plant Finder. The third principle of naturescaping is to incorporate plants that provide year-round features. So this means selecting species that are going to provide habitat resources and aesthetic value beyond the bloom season, and it'll provide a more interesting garden for you and also creates richer habitat. So if you think about planting a garden of annual flowers, the reality is that many of those are going to bloom at the same time, and then they don't really provide anything for the rest of the year. Um, so that short bloom window leaves a lot of our pollinators and our wildlife in the lurch. But if you're picking plants that have multiple seasonal interests, um, that, that can serve wildlife, and they have varying bloom times, you're going to be providing much higher quality habitat. So remember that flowers themselves are only around for a short time. So be thinking about what other parts of the plant will be available to provide beauty and wildlife resources. So some examples of plants that you could, that you could provide um, to, to have year round features include the red flowering currant, which is up in the upper left. That's an early blooming shrub. It's really important for the Anna's hummingbird, which is a, a year-round resident in Oregon. Um, and also a lot of early season pollinators rely on this. So the bees that start coming out in, in March don't have a whole lot around that they can go to, but the red flowering current is available for them. Uh, next to that one is a picture of sedges and rushes. These are species that are really well suited for wet areas and they can provide really vibrant greenery all year round. Then looking at the bottom we've got some deciduous tree leaves so those provide really beautiful color in the fall and then when those leaves drop they provide some really important nutrients to the soil. And then the last picture is of the red twig dogwood. Um, so that's in the middle of winter and it's lost all of its leaves but it is still providing a really nice color source. So these are some um, Pacific Northwest native plants that can provide those year-round features. Not only can plants look good year-round, but they can also modify the environment around them, which can help save you money. Uh, this is especially the case with trees and larger shrubs. Trees are great for blocking southwest sun exposure, which provides shade and keeps the area underneath them cool. Deciduous trees are great for providing shade during the summer, but still allowing light during the winter time. Now, uh, planting large shrubs can also help block cold winter winds. By planting large shrubs on the northern side of, of residence, 
This can block those, those winter winds from blowing into house, houses, which can help reduce your heat costs along the way. Throughout the presentation, we've emphasized wildlife habitat. So it's no wonder that the fifth principle of naturescaping is wildlife habitat. Here in Washington County, we are a part of the Pacific Flyway, which means that we have millions of bird species that migrate through the region. And each one of these species benefits from our, these backyard habitats that we're trying to create. Likewise, we have a plethora of pollinators that call the area home. Native bees, butterflies, moths, even bats also benefit from these habitats. Now, one of the best ways that you can support wildlife is to learn more about them. And there's a ton of resources out there to do so. Visiting our website or your local library, or even stopping at a local bookstore and, and purchasing some literature on wildlife that can be found in your region. It's a great way to, to learn more about your neighboring wildlife. When creating wildlife habitat, it's important to remember the three main elements of habitat, which are food, water, and shelter. When creating different food sources within your landscape, you want to remember that different wildlife need different types of foods. If you're trying to attract birds to your landscape, Remember to, to put in plants that have seeds or berries. Some of my favorite Pacific Northwest natives that will attract birds are gonna be the organ grape or the red flowering currant that we saw earlier. If you're trying to attract more pollinators to your landscape, put in plants that provide pollen or nectar sources. Some, some great Pacific Northwest natives for that are gonna be the mock orange, the Douglas spirea, and even yarrow, which is a, a nice ground cover to be able to put in. Additionally, animals need wildlife, need water just like people do. There's a ton of ways that you can incorporate uh, water into your landscape. Bird baths are a pretty common way that folks do this. You can also put in a pollinator bath, which is essentially just a shallow dish with uh, water in it and then rocks so that uh, different pollinators can come and perch on that and still have access to that water source. And finally, you want to provide shelter in, within your landscape for wildlife. Shelter provides protection for wildlife, but it also provides nesting opportunities so that they can rear their young. Shelter sources such as snags, which are standing dead trees, uh, rock or brush piles, all give a, a place for wildlife to, to live. Principle six is water conservation. Not only do naturescaped landscapes provide, are not only are naturescape landscapes ecologically beneficial, but they also can help save money on your water bill. Water conservation starts with the soil. So it's important to know what type of soil that you have. Your soil dictates the amount of water that your landscape can absorb. Soils with more organic material or compost hold more water. There are several ways that you can test your soil. Uh, you can send in your, uh, a soil sample into a lab to get detailed re results, or you can do simple everyday tests to find out some of the basic properties of your soil. One test that we often recommend is called the squeeze test. If you take a small handful of dampened soil in your hand and roll it around, the, the soil type that you have will depend on how that soil reacts when you open your hand. If that soil type stays together when you open your hand, you're going to have a, a more clay soil, which is what we frequently have here in the Willamette Valley. If you roll around that soil and open your hand and the soil immediately falls away, you're going to have a more sandy soil. If you roll around that soil in your hand and open it and it stays together, but then if you take a, you know, if you press it slightly and it falls apart, you'll have a more loamy soil. Loamy soils are a great planting material and that's what you're really aiming for as you're creating your landscape. Plant type and placement are also important, uh, also impact your landscape's ability to hold water. By grouping plants with similar water needs, 
you're gonna be you're gonna make watering much easier so that you can just water them all together. If you do are if you are planning on putting plants that do have high water needs, plant those near lawns so that they can absorb any runoff as you're watering your your lawn. And also, there's a ton of simple ways that you can uh, be more water e efficient. Watering at dusk and dawn helps reduce the, the amount of evaporation that happens. You can also maintain efficient landscapes by pruning or using mulches over bare soil. This all helps your landscape use, keep all of the water that, that you're putting into it. And also always consider planting with native plants. Native plants are well adapted to our, cl our climate, so they'll need a little bit of watering to establish, but after they're established, they won't meet, need much. Once you have a good planting soil, it's important to keep the soil you have, which brings us to our seventh principle, soil stabilization. When stabilizing soils, it's important to use plants with a variety of root types. You want plants that have different types of, of roots. So you want plants that have tap roots, which are a single root system that goes deep into the, the ground. You also want to have plants that have fibrous roots, which have which go deep, but they're more spreading out than a tap root. Likewise, you'll want to have spreading roots, which are shallow spread, which are shallow roots, but they do hold on to the, the landscape. By using different root types, you are creating a network that holds your soil into place so that it won't run off in, in the wintertime as rains or winds pick up. Now, if you're wondering what, um, if you're wondering what type of root um, a, a plant has, a good rule of thumb to remember is that each plant has a different type of root, which is another reason why you really want to incorporate different plants throughout your, uh, your landscape. Now, soil stabilization is also really important when dealing with slopes. So as you're looking at these two images here, the image on the left shows a slope that's been stabilized by strawberry plants. This is not ideal, but it's better than just having a, 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 a landscape or a slope with grass. Grass roots are very shallow, so they don't hold on to, uh, onto that soil very well, and it can quickly run off. This photo on the right shows a, a slope that's been uh, stabilized with a variety of plant types. Now, this is an, an excellent, excellent example on how you can stabilize slopes. By having a wide variety of plants, you have a, a huge root network in that ground, and that's going to hold on to all of the soil on that slope. You can also use rock terracing to stabilize slopes. A rock terrace is uh, a way that you're building small garden beds on a slope side using rocks. Uh, rock terracing projects do take a while, so you really want to plan out accordingly and undertake it in steps and make sure to, to take, um, to incorporate steps that will help prevent erosion as you're building your rock terrace. The next principle of naturescaping is finding rainwater solutions. So this is all about finding ways to slow rainwater and prevent it from running off of your property. And stormwater is the term we use for rainwater that is turning into runoff. So you might he hear people talk about stormwater solutions as well. So the key to understanding this concept is actually to think about the soil. Healthy soil is a, is a sponge. It's absorbing and holding water making it available for plant use, filtering out pollutants, and replenishing groundwater. But as our communities develop, we're covering more of the soil and our natural land with impervious surfaces. Those are surfaces that the water can't flow through, so concrete, our homes, our buildings. So this means that there's less absorption of the rainwater into the ground. So where does that rainwater go? It ends up running across the land horizontally and it's picking up debris and pollutants as it's making its way towards sewer systems and eventually into streams and rivers. So this, this is known as runoff and it can cause huge problems for water quality. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is the phrase, if it hits the road, it hits the river. So think about all of those chemicals and pollutants that, that water will pick up and bring to our waterways if we're allowing it to run off of our properties. 
So it can be helpful to see what this process looks like in a natural area versus a developed area. So we've got a series of graphics across two slides here that show where the rainwater is going as our community undergoes more development. So starting on the left, this is an undeveloped area. And so there's natural ground cover and very little water is running off the land. You can see there's 10% runoff. So the trees and the plants and the soil are capturing most of that precipitation. And about 50% of the water that falls is actually soaking into the ground, um, going into the root zone and going deeper into um, the soil to replenish our groundwater. And all of this water is being cleaned by soil microbes. So any pollutants in there are being filtered out. So all that water is recharging our streams and our wetlands and our groundwater. Then if we move over to the right, we're in a slightly more developed area. So maybe this is your rural community. And so we see that there is a bit more development. We've got a road and some buildings, and there's a slight decrease in the amount of water that's soaking into the ground and a, an increase in the water that is running across the land horizontally. So even just a few structures is creating this change. So as development continues, um, on the left there, we're looking at about 50% impervious surface. So remember, impervious is the surfaces that the water cannot flow through. So this might be our suburban landscape. More of the vegetation has been cleared, more impervious surfaces are created, and with half of the land covered in concrete and infrastructure, we've caused a 50% decrease in the amount of water that's able to soak into the ground. So now we're seeing our runoff is at 30% and the amount of water that's getting down into the soil where we really need it has decreased significantly. And in the final graphic, we're looking at an urban area where there might be close to 100% cover of impervious surfaces. So this means that very little water can soak into the ground naturally and a large amount of it is running across the land, picking up oil, pet waste, debris, and lots of other pollutants and bringing it eventually to our waterways. So the concept of including rainwater solutions in your naturescaping plan is all about finding ways to keep water on the property and reduce the runoff. So wherever possible, you want to be collecting water, conveying it to the parts of the property where it can soak into the ground, slowing down the flow, and creating opportunities for it to kind of sit on the soil, soak in, be taken up by plant roots, or evaporate. And there's a variety of ways that you can accomplish this. So the examples on this slide include adding compost to the soil and covering the soil with mulch. Um, compost is organic matter and when it's added to the soil, it actually increases the amount of water that that soil can hold. And then mulch is a pervious surface that water can soak through and it's also very absorbent. So that's a good option for places that you might have otherwise put something like concrete to create a pathway. Now you've got something that the water can soak through. On the right, you see an example of harvesting rainwater. So that's a cistern that has been hooked up to the, the gutter system in the downspout. And this allows you to capture the rainwater from your roof and use it on your property. So you can be watering your landscape with it. Um, and that means that it's staying in the, in the place where that rainwater is falling rather than running straight into the sewer system. Rain gardens are also a very popular way to manage rainwater. So these are sunken gardens that are designed to capture and store rainwater that is piped from a roof or some other impervious area on the property. So by creating a tub, you're allowing the water to pool there and then slowly absorb into the ground. Um, and these rain gardens, you'll see all different shapes and sizes um, around our community. People are getting really creative with their design. Um, and all of these are using plants that are able to survive in wet conditions and can really efficiently process water. So filtering out pollutants um, and, and taking up the water. We've got a couple more examples. On the left, you see a few examples of pervious surfaces. So wherever possible on the property, it's a good idea to pull up impervious surfaces like concrete pathways and driveways and replace them with surfaces that water can soak through. And we mentioned this when we were talking about mulch just a couple slides ago. Um, but here's a few more options. The inset picture shows a type of paver called a pervious paver. So this is a great option for spaces where you still want a hard surface like a driveway, 
but it allows the water to soak through in between those different pavers. Um, then the larger picture is what's known as a Hollywood driveway. So the middle part of the driveway has been replaced by a natural surface. surface. So again, you have those hard surfaces where you need them in the tire tracks, but then you've removed the space that really didn't need to be a, a concrete surface to begin with. And now the water has, has space to soak into the, the ground. And the last example here we have is a green roof. And there are a lot of design factors to keep in mind if you are planning a green roof. They're very heavy. You have to be very careful about the, the drainage. But it is a really fun way to turn an impervious surface, like a rooftop, into one that can absorb and transpire water. So you might see these on, um, on buildings as you move around in the urban area. So to put it all together, we have our final principle, which is incorporating native plants into your landscape. And native plants are plants that are adapted to your local climate. So um, we're in the Pacific Northwest. The examples we've been providing are Pacific Northwest natives, but a native plant is going to depend on where you actually are living. Um, and they are a key part to achieving all of the previous principles that we discussed, soil stabilization, water conservation, wildlife habitat, rainwater solutions. So plant selection is going to be a major part of your nature scaping project. If you don't know where to start looking for native plants, we do suggest that you ask your local nursery if they have a native plant section. And also keep an eye out for native plant sales hosted by local community groups. In Washington County and around Oregon, we have a lot of groups that host um, fall and spring native plant sales. So this principle is all about putting the right plant in the right place. And one way to think about this, we keep mentioning, is to try mimicking the plant communities that you see in nature. So if you have a particularly wet area of your property, think about the groups of plants you might see in a wetland. Or if your property is shaded by large trees, think about the types of plants you may see in a forest understory. And keep in mind what your objectives are. So as we said in the beginning, this is an, an all or nothing practice. You may have specific principles that you're really focused on, and that's gonna help you decide which plants you want. So for example, if you're looking to stabilize soil on a slope, you're gonna wanna find pick plants that have strong fibrous root structures or deep root structures. Or if you're looking to create a rain garden to, to manage your rainwater runoff, you're gonna wanna find plants that do well with wet feet. So your plant selection will really be dependent on the conditions of your yard or community space, as well as the object objectives that you're focusing on. And there are many benefits to working with native plants. We've touched on those all throughout the presentation. But to summarize, these are key to any naturescaping project because native plants are adapted to the local soil and adapted to the local climate, meaning that they won't require much maintenance once they're established. Um, they're also less susceptible to common garden pests and diseases. So it's gonna reduce your need for any pesticides. Um, and they also attract a wide variety of native birds and butterflies and other species. So native plants and native wildlife have evolved together over years and years and years in the, in the regions that they are. And so they've got really unique relationships um, and, and dependencies. So we want to share a couple examples of plant groups and um, Pacific Northwest natives just to get you thinking about a plant list. So the first group we're gonna look at is ground covers. And ground covers are plants that are typically those that are less than two inches tall. They can spread really easily across large areas. And so these are really helpful at suppressing weeds and helping you retain soil moisture. So if there's an area in your yard where you just need it, to, you need the soil to be covered, these are great options to look at. Um, they can be alternatives to lawn, and they can also be used as fillers between pavers or pathway stones. So the examples that we have of Pacific Northwest natives here are the redwood sorrel, the woodland strawberry, and the Oregon sedum. So the next plant group is perennials. And these are typically flowering plants that are less than two feet tall. So they create the layer above the ground cover. 
and they live over successive years. So they'll bloom and then they'll die back, but the rootstock remains there and so the next year's plant grows from that. And these can really help improve soil structure because their roots are staying in the ground over winter. Um, and so it's, it's kind of locking all that soil in place. And it's a good group to think about if you're aiming to provide year round features. So think about choosing perennials that are gonna bloom at different times of the year. We talked about some early season bloomers versus late season bloomers. So as you're making your list, think about when are these gonna flower and are you creating resources for pollinators and wildlife that stretch all the way from early spring to late summer. So the examples that we have on this slide are the bleeding heart, the wild ginger, and the red columbine. Next up is the shrub layer. So shrubs come in a variety of sizes. They can be really small ones, about two feet in height, all the way up to some that are, are getting as tall as small trees. Um, Many of these are drought resistant and can be really low maintenance. And they also can be very functional. They can help you screen unwanted views, they can provide you with privacy, and they provide great wildlife habitat and food resources. So we've got quite a few examples on this page. Um, up at the top, we've got the red osier dogwood, which we already looked at a picture of that in winter when it has just those red twigs. The red flowering currant, which we talked about, which is a, a nice early spring bloomer. Mock orange, the evergreen huckleberry, organ grape, and sword fern. And so finally, we get up to the tree layer. And this layer is great for bringing wildlife into an urban setting, especially. And trees also shelter you from sun and from winter winds. Um, and they, they have good root systems that can help hold soil in place. So there's a lot, of, a lot of good functionality from trees. And so some examples for the Pacific Northwest include the vine maple, cascara, and the western red cedar. Another thing that you'll want to consider is how you're going to manage invasive plants within your naturescape landscape. Invasive plants are plants that that aren't naturally occurring in an environment and have been brought to a new environment, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Because they are outside of their normal range, they don't have normal constraints. This allows them to grow aggressively, spread quickly, and often displace native plants by outcompeting them for resources. Invasive plants can also be harmful to humans and livestock, and even toxic in some cases. For more information about invasive plants, uh, more information about invasive plants can be found at your, um, on the website of your local SWCD. Here in Washington County, we hold annual weed watcher workshops each spring. Uh, we advise watching our website or our social media channels for, the, uh, for an announcement on when the next weed watcher workshop will be held. In Oregon, if you do, if you have found a, a high priority invasive species, uh, we do recommend that they be re reported to the Oregon Invasive Hotline, and that website can be seen here. Uh, there also will be a link in the additional resources list in the description of this uh, video. So today we've just covered the basics of naturescaping, but there are, are plenty of resources out there to help you along the way with your project. Once you have a good understanding of the basics, the next step is to start designing your project. And we have an entire course that's dedicated to just this. That's our naturescaping site design course. Uh, to find out when we're holding our, net, our next naturescaping site design course, we recommend just sending us a quick email. Um, our email address is education at tualatinswcd.org, and that's also listed in this video description. Within that course, we're really pulling all these concepts together. You know, we're, we're talking about what your landscape currently has and how you and which steps that you can take to help transform it into what it's going to be or what you want it to be. Another program that you can consider is the Backyard Habitat Certification pro, pro, um, Program, which is offered from Portland Audubon as well as the Columbia Land Trust. Uh, this is locally specific to the Portland metro area, 
but that program is designed to help urban gardeners expand habitat within their landscapes. And as you can tell, looking at the certification criteria, many of them align very closely with the naturescaping principles that we discussed today. If you're not from this region, nationally, the National Wildlife Federation offers a very similar program to Backyard Habitats, um, and their website is also listed um, in the description of this video. And finally, you can reach on out to us. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our website has a ton of additional information about naturescaping. If you live within our service area, which is Washington County, we're more than happy to set up a site visit and we can provide on-site advice to help transform your landscape. And if you're, even if you're outside of our service area, we're more than happy to connect you to resources um, or even to your local SWCD. Well, I wanna thank you for joining us for our Naturescaping Basics virtual workshop today. Uh, we really appreciate you taking time to learn a little bit of, more about Naturescaping. And as I mentioned, please don't feel or don't hesitate to reach on out to us. Thank you and have a great day.